Hello uh, and welcome to what's going to be episode eight uh, of my Stuart's vlog um, and today we're going to be looking at the restoration um, and events in Charles II's reign really is establishing that uh, the new restoration monarchy up to about 1664 and we're considering two questions firstly why does this happen why does the republic end and the restoration uh, Charles II and the Stuart monarchy are why are they restored and then secondly because the theme um, in the Stuarts uh, course is political instability. Uh, so all the questions that you get will tend towards the negative. Why are things, why don't things work out? Why does it end up in uh, in disaster really for the Stuarts every time? We're going to be thinking about the question of what is it about the restoration settlement itself that uh, lays the foundations for the Stuart monarchy in 1688, um, being really chased out the country um, in the Glorious Revolution. So firstly, uh, why does this happen at all? Well, it's partly to do with the death of Oliver Cromwell, of course, uh, who had been the glue that stuck the protectorate together. Um, and he had left the keys to the protectorate um, in the hands of his son, Richard. But Richard, bless him, seems to have been quite nice, but not particularly cut out for the role of statesman. Um, and so under pressure from the military, from the army council, he ended up resigning. Um, now, the Army Council then uh, seemed to be putting pressure on Parliament to, to try and dissolve that as well. Um, and at that point, Parliament asked for help from General Monk, who was a key figure in all this. He was the commander of the army in Scotland. Uh, he had been sent there to put down rebellions um, and to ensure um, stability uh, and loyalty amongst the Scots. And he'd done that extremely successfully, but also quite ruthlessly. Um, if, for instance, in 1654, he'd put down a royalist rebellion. Um, and uh, then straight away had put down a, a level of rebellion in his own army, led by his own second in command. So he was pretty straight down the line and quite a moderate amongst um, Republicans. In fact, he probably maybe even wasn't a Republican anyway. And there had been rumours that he was in favour of um, a royalist return. However, he had always been loyal to Oliver Cromwell. He had got on well with him. He had declared loyalty to Protectorate. And when Oliver Cromwell died, he declared loyalty to Richard Cromwell. He doesn't intervene to help Richard, uh, but Richard didn't ask him to. Um, Parliament, on the other hand, does ask him to. And so at the point when the Army Council is putting pressure on them and trying to undermine them, and they ask Monk to come south and sort things out, and he does. He arrives in London with uh, a considerable force, um, uh, unchallenged by the army, who sort of melt away before him in February 1660. And pretty quickly, he starts to work towards um, uh, a, a reconciliation with Charles Stuart, uh, who becomes Charles II. Um, this is aided by, uh, he brings back, sorry, he, in Parliament he um, senses that the mood is against the rump of Parliament, which had been restored, um, and he then recalls those MPs that Pride's Pledge had um, dismissed. Now, some of them had died, of course, but he, he recalls the ones that are still living, um, and so restores the long Parliament. They dissolve themselves and call elections, and the elections, uh, uh, which are in March and April, return what's called the Convention Parliament on the 25th of April 1660. This is very important because this showed that public opinion, such as you can measure it in elections in those days, public opinion was very much on the side um, of the Restoration because it, is, it, it, it returned a Parliament that was in favour of that. Um, in the meantime, Charles II uh, had issued what was called the Declaration of Breda. In fact, uh, Monk had advised Charles II to move from Catholic held lands to Protestant, uh, the Protestant Netherlands, which was pretty shrewd. Um, and it issued the Declaration of Breda, which was essentially a sort of olive branch to Parliament and said, um, I don't blame you. I'm not coming over uh, as a witch hunt. I'll be nice. I'll be tolerant. Um, pick me. I'll be the best king. So that kind of soothed people's nerves as well. And on the 25th of May, Charles II landed uh, in Dover. So um, things to, to bear in mind here, the death of Oliver Cromwell is key to the ending of the protectorate. He was the person, one person who could hold things together. Military involvement is key to the ending of, of the protectorate. Um, and then thirdly, I think public opinion is key to ending uh, of the protectorate. And the convention, the election of the Convention of Parliament is a good way of showing that. You have also got fears about religious radicalism um, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. But I think that they are also shown to be ongoing um, and could also be roped in there as, as a reason for the ending. So um, Charles II, so the important thing to note about Charles II's return is that uh, he is welcomed back as king uh, without any, uh, with joy 
and, and celebration, but without any sort of pre-nuptial agreements, which set out how and what sort of king he's going to be. So a lot of the old issues remain um, as he returns, and they're kind of things that they uh, are now going to have to sort out as they go. Well, the Convention Parliament starts to get on with that and um, make some decent progress in some areas. Um, an act of indemnity and oblivion is passed, and that gives free pardon to most people who had worked for the Republic. Um, there are 33, um, the 33 surviving regicides are tried as traitors, um, a sentence to death, although some of them have that commuted to life imprisonment, they do still lose their, their lands. But apart from those 33, and I think four others, and maybe one or two more, um, and the digging up of Cromwell, all of Cromwell, which is pretty tasteless in my opinion. Um, apart from those sort of few acts, actually there's no real bloodletting um, and life moves on. Um, and in fact, um, although Crown and church lands are restored. Crown and church lands that have been taken are restored to them. They are restored with compensation to those people that had bought them. And the, the lands that royalists had had to sell to uh, pay for fines and taxes, such as the militia tax under the major generals, those are not restored. Um, and so this is a way of, of Charles II kind of saying, I'm coming back, but I'm not overturning the rule of law that's been in operation in the last sort of 10 years or so. He does undo, though, the law. So all the laws that had been passed since about 1641 are wiped away. Now, that returns the monarchy to a position where uh, where they were just before the start of the Civil War. So there are no more prerogative courts um, and the Triennial Act uh, remains um, temporarily. And that meant there had to be a parliament every three years. But it does um, wipe away um, some of the other things, such as uh, bishops uh, and the, uh, the supremacy of the Church of England. They both come back. It does also wipe away the Navigation Act, but they replace that um, with a replica. Um, other than that, there's not a lot much uh, that the Convention Parliament does uh, on religion. The only other thing that it tries to start sorting out is uh, that they grant Charles an annual income of 1.2 million uh, in grants and subsidies. Um, and then uh, Charles dissolves Parliament in 1660. Now he does this because the Convention Parliament had been elected, of course, without any royal backing. So it was an unusual and perhaps unconstitutional Parliament. Um, certainly um, it was irregular. And so he dismisses it in order to call a parliament as king, uh, which he does. Um, in that sort of intervening space, uh, one important event uh, is uh, the, called Venner's Rising, led by Thomas Venner in January 1661. Now, in part, this sort of sways the mood towards a more sort of hardline royalist um, uh, sympathies. Uh, I guess, in the election, although there is a sense that now Charles II is back, that people are kind of like joyful of that. And they're, they're kind of like, oh, let's just restore things to the old days anyway. Um, just to go on about Venner's arriving for a moment, uh, that Thomas Venner was a fifth monarchist. He and other fifth monarchists believed that Jesus was physically coming back very soon. They thought all the signs were there for that. And that to please Jesus uh, in some strange way, that they needed to physically capture London before he got back so they could kind of say, look what we've done for you. Aren't we great? And so Thomas Benner and uh, 50 or so um, followers um, actually seize uh, St Paul's temporarily. They're driven out there. They, they Basically, they kind of run around London a bit, uh, having skirmishes for about three days. It, enough to cause quite a lot of trouble and unrest and fear and suspicion. Not enough to ever be in any serious position to, to take over London itself. Um, in the aftermath, uh, hundreds of people are arrested, uh, religious radicals who are arrested, um, and um, attitudes towards non-conformity are certainly hardened. And you see that in the shift in attitude between the Convention Parliament and the Cavalier Parliament, which sat for the first time in May 1661. The Cavalier Parliament um, has been described as more royalist than Charles II himself. It's stuffed full of royalists and Anglicans. And actually, it's a parliament that, that uh, there's no more election until 1679. So it's, it exists for a long, long time. Now, they uh, kind of finish off the what's called the Restoration Settlement uh, by passing the Militia Act, which made the king, uh, restored the king's position as head of the army and the navy. They brought back bishops into the House of Lords. They confirmed the right of the king to pick his own ministers um, and to run foreign policy. Really, those three, three things, um, the militia, the bishops and running foreign policy and picking ministers, four things, uh, are all reconfirming the king's um, supremacy 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis Parliament. So the king is back in power. Um, they also soften the Triennial Act. So rather than saying you must have a parliament every three years, it sort of says, well, we'd like you to have a parliament every three years if you could fit it in. Um, and they also work on that um, uh, financial settlement. So power is very much restored to uh, to Charles II. But the reins uh, that sort of keep him in check are how much money they're willing to give him. Now, they'd already passed that idea of 1.2 million. It immediately, it was clear that that wasn't going to be enough, uh, partly because they weren't collecting it very efficiently, but also because Charles was spending quite a lot of money. So the half tax is passed in 1662. This was quite popular because it literally meant that tax collectors came into your house, checked uh, how many um, halves there were, fireplaces there were, and then charged you an amount of money accordingly. The idea is progressive in that you know, the more the bigger your house, the more fires you have, the more wealthy you are, and therefore the more you could afford it. But people resented the idea that tax collectors were snooping around their house looking for evidence of, of fireplaces. It also uh, didn't work in the sense that it didn't raise enough money. And actually, immediately, there's then criticism of Charles II. Now, this is one of the things, of course, that had been a problem for Charles I. Hasn't really been solved during the, uh, the Republican era, and it's going to continue to be a problem for Charles II. So um, whilst the issue of power is solved, in a sense, because power is given back to Charles II, the issue of money and uh, uh, power in practice, because you don't have the money, you can't actually operate in the way that you want to, is an ongoing issue. Uh, and we'll see that get worse to Charles II through into the six, well, through the 1660s and into the 1670s. The third area, uh, of course, is our old friend religion. Um, and the Cavalier Parliament immediately is very hard line on religion. Um, uh, a bunch of acts are passed called the Clarendon Code after um, Charles II's chief minister. Ironically, the Earl of Clarendon actually wasn't in favour of all these things, but they get named after him because he was chief minister at that time. They are the Corporation Act, uh, passed in 1661, which meant that if you had any official position, you had to swear uh, both allegiance to the king and also um, you had to be a practising member of the Church of England. The Act of Uniformity, which meant that if you were a clergy, part of 1662, the Act of Uniformity, which meant if you were clergy in the Church of England, you had to accept the prayer book um, and had to be ordained by a bishop. This was basically saying you had to be properly Anglican. And a lot of nonconformist people who had joined the church during the Republican era are forced out. It's called the Great Ejection, which sounds a little bit rude, if you ask me. Um, two and a half thousand or so uh, ministers leave the Church of England uh, as a result of the Great Ejection, uh, many of them actually going um, to the colonies uh, in America. Um, so Corporation Act, uh, Act of Uniformity. The third act is the Conventicle Act of 1664, which um, uh, fined or imprisoned anyone caught having uh, a, a church meeting or a prayer meeting, a religious meeting in essence, that hadn't been sanctioned by the Church of England. Um, there were numbers of people who were involved there. It basically meant that you know, if you basically had people around who weren't members of your family, then you were potentially in trouble. Um, and the fourth act was the Five Mile Act, which is my favourite, uh, 1665, which banished clergy who were dismissed uh, under the Act of Uniformity so far away from their congregations that they would never be seen again, uh, all five miles, um, which seems comedy to me. Anyway, these acts together were deliberately trying to root out uh, nonconformity um, and return the Anglican Church to a position of supremacy. Um, these are actually, uh, of course, immediately against Charles II's idea of, of tolerance. And you see that straight away in the 1662 um, Declaration of Indulgence, where Charles II effectively says, oh, but we'll let these people off uh, obedience to the law. Uh, in, in a way that our, our Queen, of course, can't do that. But, but he's literally saying that uh, everyone has to obey the law except these people on this particular law. Parliament forced him to take that back. But um, straight away, again, you can see that religion is going to be an issue between a hard line Parliament um, and a tolerant. Um, and of course, as we find out later on, a Catholic sympathising uh, monarch. So uh, religious, uh, the Restoration Settlement, just in finishing because I've gone on a long time, uh, does set things up. It does restore power to the monarch. It is very pro-monarch, but it's kind of more pro-monarch than it is pro-Charles II. And I think that's that's the problem, that the, the Cavalier Parliament want a king, but they don't necessarily want the actual king that, that they've got, or they're more in favour of the monarchy than they are in favour of the person. Um, and so they give him the power, but they don't quite give him the money. 
and they impose a religious settlement that he's not really in favour of. Um, next time we'll see, of course, how that uh, unravels through the 1660s and 1670s, um, and I will see you then. Cheerio.